Um, okay, so my chat is I see what you mean. Apart from the absolutely cracking pun there, uh, it's really about creating a high fidelity escalator to the pyramid of pain. So essentially, it's all about action, actionable intelligence using the pyramid of pain as conduit to that. So, who am I? Uh, so, my name is Dan Kingsoth, so I have the terrible title of Dossin, so I couldn't think of anything creative. Uh, so, I'm the threat intelligence manager uh, at Admiral Group, and my goodness me, this is going to tell. So, experience, so 10 years in cyber, so Tesla pains and Tesla threats. Um, so, some of you in, the, in this room may have worked with me before, unfortunately. Uh, and so, I come from Symantec, CGI, Admiral, Admiral twice actually, so I love the place so much, I went back again. Uh, NCC and ECC. Uh, so enough of that. Let's go back. There we go. Uh, so just to give everyone in the room uh, a quick sit rep in terms of what we're discussing today. So what is threat intelligence? So quick raise of hands to get everyone involved. Uh, who locks their door at night? Me. And who locks their car at night? Me. And who locks their attic door? Oh, wow. Yeah. Good, effort. Good effort, yeah. I've got to keep them in. Yeah. So, so... <laughs> and my comedy gifts for the day. Um, and so the premise here is ultimately you're using threat intelligence on a daily basis, whether you know it or not. And so again, it's all about informing decision making using uh, threat intelligence to guide you through that. And so here it just gives you kind of a, a visual view in terms of where threat intelligence comes from in terms of collection, processing, analysis. Okay, and that's what we call the intelligence cycle. So how does that work from a cyber perspective? Is really, uh, in this particular uh, avenue, we're looking at effective threat detection. So some of you may know the term indicators of compromise, so IOC. Uh, so it's been heavily banded around in terms of how it's used. Um, so just to give you kind of, again, a sit rep in terms of what it actually means. So an indicator of compromise is what has happened. So it's essentially a reactive state. Uh, so as a result of that, your detection workflow in terms of when you can detect that is, well, arbitrary figure that way. Uh, and so the reason why I mention it like that is because based on current reporting from Mandian and IBM, time to detect, mean time to detect is roughly 21 days to 323 days, which is absolutely ridiculous. Uh, when you consider the fact that based on current analysis, that it takes roughly two to four days for external ransom, uh, like John and Sophos mentioned earlier on. So to that end, we then look to branch out our detection window by introducing indicators of attack. So what is happening? And so that's considered a more so a proactive approach rather than, okay, we've seen bad stuff happening, it's too late because they're already out the door with your crown jewels. Uh, again, so in terms of time span, we're looking at a t equals zero there in terms of infiltration. However, what I want to propose today is a whole new term. Uh, well, partly term. So a lot of this is... Uh, well, these indicate these indicate the terms at least were actually uh, first crowned by Balbix, uh, so it's a branding group, but nevertheless uh, an indicator of risk. So essentially, what can happen? So a lot of this talk is really about using what we consider indicators of compromise to actually predictively block or deny attackers using indicators of risk. And so, of course, there our detection window is far higher. So what we're looking at here is really pre-compromise. So in the industry. What we call left of bang. Uh, so that's really where we should move more to, well, not say move more towards, but at least focus on. It's something that, yes, we always consider as compromise. However, at the same time, I think sometimes there is a considerable degree uh, of effort that should be being placed in terms of uh, the left of bang. So again, pre compromise and how we can detect the attacker before they can get into the environment. Okay. So how do we do that? So from a side perspective, you may be aware of the Pyramid of Pain. So who better to say that than watch your man around the challenge? <laughs> so can I hear a Pyramid of Pain? Pyramid Nobody! Of pain. Yay! Thank you! <laughs> um, so the Pyramid of Pain is all about increasing adversary <laughs> operational cost. Um, and it's all about just making it harder for the attacker. And, and that's essentially the premise of it. And sometimes this does get confused in terms of, okay, these are actually really hard things to do. For a defender, however, trivial, easy, simple, it's all about increasing the level of pain for an attacker, which making it harder for the attacker to move. Essentially, swimming in treacle is far better for us as defenders than, uh, than in the case of you know, everything safe. Uh, however, an interesting piece in where this kind of chat grew from 
uh, is a, a slide that I had from years ago, really, that I created in terms of the permutations of that, just like we do from a, a red team perspective or a, an attacker perspective in terms of uh, password lists, array tables, all that good stuff, is permutations in terms of how big these spaces are. And so what I mean by that is hash values. So MD5, 2 to the power 128, so huge, huge spaces there. Similarly enough, as we go up, IPv4, 4.3 billion permutations you could possibly have there <coughs> as you move up. Pyramid of Pain, 630 million, uh, again, based on currents. Uh, and similar enough, network host artifacts, tens of thousands as you move up to that again, tools. So you're looking at, based on attack v 12 718 different tools. <coughs> so as you can see, even though these things uh, hard, uh, are easy for an attacker to change, these things actually are much harder for an attacker to change. However, you can see the permutation space is much smaller. Therefore, actually, it's much easier for a defender to apply some of these controls. However, that said, there's a lot of kind of state at the moment in terms of domain names, IP addresses, hash values, because they are easier to change. They are somewhat banded about that they are no longer required for use. And I disagree with that because there are a number of different uh, scalpel uh, things you can do. Scalpel, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, there's a number of different things you can do uh, to still use IP addresses, hash values, etc., uh, which are detective high-fidelity controls. Uh, and so if we go from there, you can actually see, okay, well, great, we've got the pyramid of pain, everything's solved. However, reality strikes. So if you go to, say, an Intel vendor, um, they will provide you with a threat data feed. It's not a threat Intel feed. Um, however, we can see here, based on historical analysis, that there is a considerable overlap, well, a considerable lack of overlap of Intel feeds. So historically, from 2014, uh, there's been an a ongoing research in terms of how much overlap there has been within Intel feeds. Um, it's pretty poor. I mean, there's 6% in 2014, 3% in 2015. So again, it shows that the sources that they're all pulling from are entirely different. And so even though you think, okay, that's great because they all find different stuff, Great, but from an end customer perspective, you have to buy all the feeds to have any sort of overlap. Therefore, you have no real confidence in whether that one feed that you have is any good. Uh, and that's why, yes, we have, we use paid feeds within Admiral Group. However, at the same time, we fully well understand that they're not finding everything, and nobody is. And so that's why some of it is not to say the fallacy, um, but it's definitely not the be all and end all just to say you have an IOC feed coming in. As I mentioned just a minute ago, uh, most vendor offerings are in what is the hash values of the written and domain names, and nevertheless also it's not targeted towards yourself. So it lacks the context, it lacks the situation awareness. For example, who would care from a burglar perspective in terms of, okay, what someone in vendors where is doing? Don't get me wrong, yes, the internet is a big place. However, at the same time, we really want a lot of these pieces here to fall into what we care about. Mm -hmm. And so that's part of the talk today. Similarly enough, our current analysis, uh, well, MISP's current analysis in terms of their feed overlap analysis metrics. So if anyone uses MISP, you're, you'll note uh, that they do have a overlap analysis metrics, which is built on the fly, which is pretty good. Uh, as you can see here, even it doesn't matter, you can't read this, it's all green. And green essentially means bad because there is zero overlap for the most part. 99% of all feeds within MISP provided have zero overlap, which again pushes towards us, okay, well, everyone knows about nothing rather than, okay, well, actually, this is bad, confirmed by this, by, by this feed, by this feed, by this feed. However, we are going to use some of these feeds uh, for our examples later on. So, to build up that pyramid of pain, we'll first look at hash values. So, when people think of hashes, they think of file hashes, and an MD5, SHA-1. However, there are other hashes available that you can use. Uh, one of those is MMHash, uh, so MMH3 is a non uh, non-cryptographic uh, algorithm to so essentially hash uh, files, uh, well, hash things. Uh, in this instance, what we're using it for is to detect malicious infrastructure. So you can see here, MMH3 hash, we get closer to the SHA-1 hash. Uh, so MMH3 is a algorithm used by Shodan, and SHA-1 is used by Sensors. But nevertheless, I was originally looking to discuss JAM hashes. However, there is a level of fidelity issues in terms of uh, you can easily randomize JAM hashes. JAM hashes, if you're not aware, is about uh, the hashing of uh, SSL handshakes. Um, so we can see here that, okay, well, we can easily highlight default configurations on Posh2 and Shadowpad. 
Why default? Why do we care about that? Because there's a lot out there. But we know that they do require infrastructure. They may not think that um, they will have to change their infrastructure based on based on how high a tier of attacker they are. So if we take this further out and expand it on, I did some uh, further analysis and actually identified 129 plugins, uh, 35 provenant, root red tail 32, Metasploit was huge. Again, a lot of people use Metasploit, but nevertheless. Again, it shows about all these attackers that actually you could easily block um, or create further analysis off the back of that. An interesting one, if you really want to annoy your testers, if you really want to annoy your pen testers, uh, it's an easy way to identify the collaborator. So if anyone's trying some convoluted out of bounds uh, SQL or anything, there's 540 on the web that you can block straight off the bat. Uh, similar enough, missed instances as well, uh, 707. I, th I thought, well, maybe you could DDoS some of those potentially. I don't know. Um, but really, the premise of that is, again, to use hashes uh, to jump up the perimeter pane. So to identify IP addresses of the infrastructure, just like we have there. But also, again, if you're blocking their infrastructure, you're impacting uh, on their tools and potentially their TPPs as well. Uh, so again, rather than just a file hash that is only used from that one particular thing, we can actually start to fingerprint their infrastructure and start to attack the attacker. Moving on to IP addresses. Um, so again, we know they're going to potentially, well, we know they're likely going to attempt to active scan us from a reconnaissance perspective. So therefore, again, our own faithful tool, pretty sure everyone thinks, oh, well, you know, you know, let's, let's block it or let's not block it. Uh, it could be uh, for business use, uh, but nevertheless, doing some quick analysis on that uh, based on our paid feeds that we have, 98% uh, of the current Tor node list. Uh, oh, <coughs> sorry, I recognise them. So, um, <laughs> uh, just easily distracted, Magpie. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so 98% of the traffic uh, has seen historical attacks on that. So, again, it really lends itself to, okay, that's probably not a good thing uh, to actively let them scan or actively let them hit the network. Uh, and Caesar recommend a blended approach, so which is a case of block all on particular traffic, so whether that be your VPNs, uh, any sort of crown jewels and uh, traffic that you really do care about, and then detect and monitor on others. For example, home brand sites, main brand sites, things like that. Uh, what do we mention at all? Again, it's an easy route that people think, okay, there's a level of anonymity to it. However, there's a lot of analysis, again, largely driven by Chinese in terms of detecting tour nodes, obviously, to kill privacy. We want to use it for a particular different purpose in terms of blocking uh, and detecting attackers. Uh, when I say deny a course of action with any of these, of course, it's a detect and deny rather than just detect and you don't see anything wrong. Uh, moving from that to ASNs, TLDs, and name servers, um, I mentioned point BPH, so bulletproof hosting providers. Uh, the premise here is there's a number of different preventive techniques that we can use to frustrate attackers. And really, it's a case of bulletproof hosting providers, they're great in terms of they don't care if you you know submit a takedown, whether it's UDRP or what have you. However, you need to make a concerted effort to actually block these bulletproof hosting providers based on the ASNs and that, okay, they may have some uh, genuine traffic. However, at the same time, what's the trade-off between the genuine traffic and the malicious traffic in there? So again, deny by association, and that does push the attackers potentially towards more legitimate infrastructure. And therefore, if they're using more legitimate infrastructure, whether it be Azure, GCP, what have you, then it potentially gives us a better chance of taking that perspective infrastructure down because then they're on the legitimate infrastructure rather than bulletproof hosting, where really you submit any sort of takedown, or like, I don't care. Um, and then similarly enough, <coughs> um, in terms of DNS operators as well, again, they're starting to use uh, legitimate DNS operators uh, what was the example? But um, yeah, there's uh, quite a few Chinese uh, DNS operators that are actively allowing a lot of malicious traffic. Therefore, we can pretty much confirm that, okay, we can just sling that if you're not using you know, Chinese infrastructure or if you're not using Chinese customers, things like that. So again, it all comes back to a systematic cataloging of maliciousness on the internet. And not to say let's just bore the ocean, but at the same time, we can use a different of these, uh, we can use some of the analysis uh, for example, Scripps teams, they have a Tor Bridges collector, uh, which again, you may think, oh, bridge nodes are you know, hidden, things like that. They're not. Um, and so then we can start to pile some of these things up to say, okay, these would be a uh, credible, um, credible list to essentially put the block in. So again, I appreciate these are all very much list-based approaches. However, there's still plenty of mileage on the clock in terms of actively using them to, again, frustrate the attacker. Because again, if we're, if we're hitting the point of the post we're hitting DNS operators, 
that are were heavily seen in malicious cases, then again, start to kill the tool, start to kill the TTPs off and make it harder for the attacker. Domain names, so this is where a, a lot of this kind of drove from. Um, and from that indicator of risk perspective, we'll know that there are likely attempts to type the spot and name their attack. And I did some analysis on the top eight top fish domains. Um, so again, DocuSign, Microsoft, PayPal, uh, all those good things. Um, and I identified that 15% of them have have been registered of permutations. So what I mean by that is if you had admiral.com, a permutation of that would be badmiral.com, for example. And so just like we do with passwords, just like we do with how we create hashes, uh, is we get every single possible permutation we can find uh, and then generate it uh, using, in this instance, um, Circle's Typo Squatter. Really good tool and it has a number of different algorithms in terms of detect you know, uh, respective TLDs, uh, respective, you know, uh, behaviours in terms of how you typo uh, squat those respective domains. So, again, really useful for us because we can say, okay, well, actually, if, if this is the whole, if this is the whole permutation space of those particular domains, then it gives us a pretty good chance to say, okay, well, actually, if we block all of those, then it's a higher chance, or a higher likelihood of us potentially blocking real live attacks. And then we do actually use this as an admiral and it has actually worked. Um, Okay, yeah, so um, as we see here, Microsoft.com, uh, again, it's not Microsoft, it's just a L there, but nevertheless, it's got a much higher likelihood of a success compared to easybq2.com. Um, so again, their behavior is just like we are, right, in terms of they are going to go uh, for those particular uh, angles that people would be susceptible to. Uh, and so based on those 50% of the top fish domains, uh, essentially, if you play those number, that's 5,675. Uh, so further analysis into that uh, revealed a number of different C2 name servers and historical malware operations. So again, it's more than all the reason to again do this analysis <coughs> within your own environment, whether it be you know, Admiral, whether it be uh, PwC, whether it be what have you. It's definitely worth double checking uh, to give you again a concise list of what possible of what possible options there are to potentially again deny as a result. So again, from there, okay, I'll keep saying again. Uh, it's my ultimately uh, domain names <laughs> to TTPs. Um, sorry, ultimately is a word I use at work all the time. It, it hurts me as well. Um, and nevertheless, yeah. Um, so yeah, so essentially what we're doing here, we're blocking domains. And then what happens there is, again, as a result of that, we're impacting TTPs and make it harder for an attacker to actually, again, create a, a, an attack that would have a high chance of success. If you want to read further into that, uh, one of the guys on the team did some really good uh, type of squat domain comparison. Um, but, an, an, but an offside to this, again, not TTP related, uh, is unintentional insider threat. And so this is definitely something that everyone can do and take away as a result. Is again, create this list based on your, your domain, based on your top 10 domains that you have in your environment. Uh, and the reason why I say that is because 6% of all breaches based on Verizon's DBR, again, some of this is inferred, but nevertheless, uh, six percent of all breaches were owed to email Mr. Degree. So essentially, that's got a pretty much near enough a high percentage. I mean, I think ten percent of the time uh, in terms of attacks are based on threats. So inside the threat is something that is, yes, it's known about, but it's definitely not given the attention that it deserves. Uh, and this is all about misdelivery of again type of squatting the whole reason for it, right? Um, so yeah, definitely worth recommended uh, to do this within your environment, and you will actually be quite interested. Well. No, like, no doubt, surprise at what you find. Um, so if you try to email me at admiralgroup.com, you'll be sending emails, whether that be sensitive data or what have you, to an admiral recruitment site, which is in the States. So it's, again, it's a flippant thing uh, that can create a potential breach and there'll be an absolute havoc for you to respond to. Similarly enough, um, similarly enough, no, no, it's dead. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's gone. Um, yeah, so definitely want to check it out because uh, it's really interesting what you can find there. Uh, and again, you, you may identify a number of different trends of, of your behaviours as well. Ah, yes. Uh, autocomplete. So autocomplete is not your friend. Um, you're going to put my teeth in, aren't you? I'm just full of, full of terrible phrases. Um, yeah, so autocomplete. So as soon as you email someone, uh, you'll identify that if you do get it wrong, then that will autocomplete based on Outlook's helpful advice. And because of that, you could then keep on sending similar data out to the respective recipient. 
so yes, it's great and it's helpful for us. However, at the same time, if you do it wrong, they will constantly send out emails uh, or potentially sensitive data to other parties. If we move now into network and artifacts, uh, is uh, an IOR is when like we know they will likely clear out infrastructure. Uh, and so some of the analysis based off Cyber is that 60% of all phishing attacks are based on a one-to-one -one clone of our own websites, which again, based on that information or based on that intelligence story, uh, we can then think, well, actually, what does our site look for? What is, it, uh, what is the specific indicators uh, that we can find as a result? For example... <laughs> <laughs> yes, hey. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, this is far too rowdy for a thing. Um, yeah, so uh, Google Tag Manager. Um, so again, if we are cloning uh, a website, uh, then we're going to put the DOM, we're going to pull everything out, including JavaScript and identifiers such as Google Tag Manager. So tracking IDs are a really easy way that we have used in the past to identify um, other clones uh, of Admiral Group and others. Um, so again, simple things to check on. Similarly enough, it's not a technique that is heavily used speaking to vendors uh, because we're constantly beating up to say, well, actually, why aren't you doing this? Uh, but nevertheless, uh, nevertheless, um, <laughs> Google, Google Tag Manager, I need to find some new words, seriously. Uh, Google Tag Manager um, has been detected and has been catalogued by Risk IQ. So they are one of the vendors among others, Group RB, et cetera, who are actually cataloging this data so you can actually identify if others are actually using your Google tracking IDs. Again, because they're highly unique, nobody else is going to be using them unless it's either for legitimate purposes or malicious. Similarly enough... <coughs> sorry, by the way, I've got this massive thing because I lost my clicker. Um, Falcons. Okay, so again, Falcons, highly unique. Yes, it's an odd thing, but nevertheless... Let me out. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, it was like, is this going real? real? Um, yeah, Farrakhan's again, it's a, a fantastic thing to detect upon because, again, if you get a hash of that job done, it gives you a really good chance uh, to identify if, if somebody is cloning the website. And again, same, as, same time, referral logs off the back of that in any successful phishing attack. Yes, if they re redirect you to a login page, what you're going to push for after that is going to be uh, pumping you back to say admiral.com or what have you which is again going to have a referral header to that so definitely worth ingesting your referral logs yes it's more of an indicator of attack in terms of yes if someone is actively attacking you rather than an indicator of risk um, that said a really good source of collection and that's really what this all is all about is identifying new collection sources that you can use to again detect the attackers so as we can see here we're going up and down uh, the pyramid of pain uh, second the last tools, so again, it comes back to the collection and cataloging uh, of respective data sets. And so we are moving towards that space in a number of different areas. Um, as you can see here, yeah, file set.io, if you're not come across it, essentially every single possible uh, file extension that can be used in phishing attacks. Again, this is where we need to move towards to identify whether they are worthy within our environment. Because again, if you never use, for example, .onenote, which is you know, the popular one right now, um, then, hey, why not just remove this uh, from an attacker's uh, tool set? Moving on to low bats and GTFO bins. Uh, it was a big fan of these at the time when they came out, and I think they still have plenty of miles on the clock. Um, if we add all those together, you can begin to identify there's 532 binaries. And if I ask, yeah, it sounds like a big number, but when you compare that to uh, 2.5 billion IP addresses, it's definitely worth doing the hard yards to identify their use uh, within, your, within your respective environments. Again, this moves somewhat into the threat entity side of things. So again, if you do have a threat entity, pass off to them. Then you have a problem. <laughs> Cheers, Luke. Cheers, um, And then moving on to that again, as we have access, actions, and generally it's likely they've got external data. It's likely based on behaviors so far and current reporting that they are going to use some level of established C2 framework. Um, a lot of the nation states, obviously, of course, the attribution aspects, things like that, all of them are generally using some form of popular C2 framework. As a result of that, there's only 124 of those uh, based on C2metrics.com. So it's worth uh, breaking these down and seeing, again, common trends, how they look within your environment, which is why you need a threat emulation team. Uh, and so, again, it's all these active, again, again, comes down to what that attacker looks like within your environment, identifying anomalous data and ultimately uh, stopping that actually from happening. 
And as you can see here, we're moving towards TPPs in terms of how they could how they take those actions and result. So here you can see every single every single uh, title has had a, a T number, again assigned to Mike Tag. TCPs, back to Montreal Man and Savage. So how does the anniversary go about accomplishing the mission? And so TCPs again are the top of the pyramid, and again it's generally the established thing that okay, this is what we need to really look for with their environment. They are harder than most. Um, and when somebody says, yes, we can search for a TTP environment, uh, they're generally half right and half wrong because there are a multitude of different known knowns, but also known unknowns as well in terms of identifying that behaviour within the environment. Uh, MITRE and Genuity have done a fantastic job. Uh, well, MITRE have done a fantastic job in creating Ingenuity. It's quite a recently released thing if you haven't come across it, uh, but it's all about, again, exactly what I mentioned here in terms of cataloguing uh, in, in introducing insights into that data set rather than saying, oh, here's 400 techniques that you need to go and detect, there you go. So it's all about that prioritised approach uh, where we can use things, for example, using prevalence, choke points, uh, actionability to identify significant techniques. Um, as you can see here, it's top 20, so I'm not going to go through them, but nevertheless, it's definitely an, an interesting insight on that is micro ingenuity in terms of how they overlay with the other respective lists. So you can see ransomware top 20 here, again, uh, considerable overlap, 70% overlap, uh, which shows us, again, that these are legitimate CTPs that we do need to prioritise as a result. Uh, most often used by threat actors, again, 95% of the course is going to be heavily skewed towards that as a result. But as you can see here, uh, it does move us on to also consider choke points. So choke points, just like you would potentially do in military, I'm not saying I'm a military person because I'm not, um, but choke points in terms of where people have to go to to get to the next stop. And so again, they are fantastic sources to hit up all day long. And no matter what, everyone's going to be pulling a command uh, and script interpreter, whether it be PowerShell or what have you. Fantastic sources that give you a data-driven, evidence-based approach to ensure that, okay, yes, we need to do that first rather than everything else, uh, rather than screen capture. Or you know, maybe even some further obscure TTPs that may think, oh, yeah, that's great. That's the new hotness at the moment. Oh, great. But is it going to be worth your while compared to hitting uh, uh, women or schedule tasks for valid accounts? Uh, and then we also uh, did some further analysis into this using MITRE's own data set. Uh, so TD Predict uh, is all about technique co-occurrence, so essentially establishing techniques that have uh, been seen, uh, and then also a secondary to technique off the back of that. Uh, so our very own Luke Linders uh, made this uh, lovely schematic, uh, of which is essentially a co-occurrence matrix. Um, and it's all about really identifying, using the data we have, again, using a data-driven approach to identify uh, insights uh, and behaviours. So we can see here that based on MITRE's current data set, uh, that phishing and user execution have a 94% co-occurrence percentage rating. You're thinking, of course, that's common sense. Five minutes? Cool. That was a bit of move magic there. Um, uh, yeah, and similar enough, if we go further down the list, you might see things that, okay, you might not consider for example, supply chain compromise uh, and phishing have an almost 100% co occurrence percentage. Again, it really drives forward that fact that, yes, we need to consider phishing, but also we need to consider our third parties in, fourth parties as well, because of these, uh, because of these insights. Uh, again, this is also shared on our GitHub as well, um, so yeah, use as, as you will. Um, but again, it's all about driving uh, the industry towards how frequently the attackers use these techniques. And for my last slide, again, if we compare all this together as our sole focus, which is to increase operational cost, right? and that is the sole focus of the pyramid of pain. Uh, it's not just to create some flash gimmicks and things like that, it is to slow down attackers and potentially even stop, and also inject it into their process as well. So if we come back to the, the, the examples that I showed you today, we will be impacting the tackle infrastructure whilst also predictively defending uh, predictive defensive actions uh, that would also reduce those permutation spaces from billions or powers uh, to thousands to hundreds or potentially even tens. So we can prioritize that another layer again. And again, it all comes back to prioritis prioritization and informing that decision making based on side effect intelligence. <laughs> 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 Questions, eh? 
Appreciate it a lot, but uh, man in the front. Oh, I don't know. You... <laughs> <laughs> well, there is one. <laughs> what, on one of your slides, you mentioned about potentially blocking large swathes of the internet, like uh, Tor and different providers. So, have you had any pushback from the business? On potentially blocking legitimate customers from access. Well, so that, that's uh, well, business, business, who cares? No, um, mm-hmm. so that that's really where it comes to the size of balance mm-hmm. approach in terms of yes, blocking things. For example, VPN. I mean, ultimately, customers aren't going to be hitting your VPN uh, for the well, for the most part. Depends how, how much of a customer they really are. Um, so, and at the same time, detection monitoring uh, based on. <laughs> did you like my joke? So, uh, yeah, and then detection monitoring uh, based on again main brand traffic so as you mentioned their customers and things like that so that would be kind of general consensus if people don't hit Tor uh, you know some yes we have you know Tor users from a privacy perspective who may be hitting our main brand sites but absolutely you know you have to allow that traffic as as you say this is impact um, again it depends on having that data that internal situation awareness to identify whether it is being used you know, yes where do you think the most effort needs to be put in it strikes me um, you know, some of this is yes, sort of hunting around and looking for things like your referral logs mm. and, and picking up some of the indicators. But surely a lot of the rest of it is actually designing your systems and your infrastructure so that you block those attacks in the way that they're hard and, and secure. So where do you think the balance? You know, what's the ratio? Um, absolutely. I mean, it's, we're always going to have to look at TTPs as being the sacrosanct kind of top of that chain in terms of what we should focus on first and so that's why I really like the uh, MITRE um, ingenuity piece because they give you top 20 IPs the top 20 TDPs not just to detect uh, but also to architect against uh, so you know, women whether we can you know, PowerShell what have you uh, these should all be architectural decisions that should be fed into those decision making as well so I definitely say those top 20 gives you a pretty good view uh, in terms of bang for your buck and as you rightly say, that yeah, they shouldn't just be considered from a detection sort of perspective. It should be being fed into the architectural process as well. Yeah, so I've been looking at um, that's the lighter stuff and all tools very helpful because we're hoping with presentations. Um, there was my own templates for Microsoft Threat Modeling tool mm. using that to actually point to we need to do these things and stop these attacks. Absolutely that, yeah. And so further on my ingenuity, definitely worth having a look if you haven't seen it already. Um, but they do have uh, focus collection sources, so whether it be cloud, network, etc. So depending on how your infrastructure looks, that might not be the top 20 for you. Uh, there may be more a cloud-specific top 20 that may be more useful for yourself. Yes. Um, I know you from email chains, um, kind of leads off that question, actually. So your, one of your initial slides about uncertainty or the pay for your feet uh, from intelligence. Yeah. How much of that is influencing around uh, your activity within more, what I can see more about being uh, proprietary, more applicable to your environment, your infrastructure, based for to what are you actually facing? Are your seniors seeing the band in the sort of that effort? Are your seniors seeing the band in that? Or are you finding it struggle that they rely on actually just taking the fees? Uh, no, I mean, the thing is, you, you, in, yes, we have had some really good wins in the last Yes, we've had some really good wins um, using these techniques. Um, so as you say, I mean, if you go to a paid, provi- paid provider, they're never going to provide you with any of this stuff just because it, to scale that out is huge, right? In terms of we need, you know, well, based on the type of squad, there's roughly around about 6,000 permutations in terms of the respective different changes they make or the key terms they use. So to scale that out to every single uh, company brand name is huge, right? So it's not something that they, I, I would think would be useful enough or big enough for them to say, okay, here's our feed of what your type of domains or permutations look like. Um, so, yeah, for us, it's more a case of, well, again, we do have the luxury to have a TI team in-house. Uh, and so, yeah, for us, that, that, that does make it much easier for us. However, for others, absolutely. I, I think there is a balance in that in terms of, uh, yeah, there is a balance in that in terms of where is the value add there? Uh, and I, I don't think the value add from a paid perspective is to say, okay, here's just more bad stuff. It has to be focused towards yourself. Uh, yeah. How um, could we um, take the rest of the questions offline? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think otherwise we'll stop running over. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for your session. <laughs>